Good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Beecher, Director of the Library and Learning Commons here at Grand Rapids Community College. I'd like to welcome you to our wonderful library and in celebration of National Poetry Month. Tonight we have David Cope who will speak to us about his latest book. Tonight's program is co-sponsored by the Library and Learning Commons and also the English Department here at GRCC. Before we get started though tonight, uh, reference librarian and archivist Mike Clewitter has created a display of David's work just to uh, your right. Um, so be sure to give that a look tonight. Also we have a card of books here also over there of books here written by uh, Michigan poets. Materials on this card obviously can be checked out uh, at the library circulation desk. On each seat, there is a half sheet with a bio of uh, David and on the other side is a signature poem. So be sure to give that a look as well. Tonight we'll also have a book signing and copies of David's book are for sale for $16. If you parked in the student lot across the street, we can validate that parking for you. Just go to the table over by where David will be with his book and we'll get you a parking validation pass. And finally, I'd like to introduce Marianne Lassert, associate professor uh, in the English department who will speak a few minutes about David and she will give him a proper introduction. So without further ado, please help me introduce, uh, help me introduce Marianne Lassert. <laughs> you a fan club, thank you. Yeah. I didn't pay them. <laughs> but they are waiting on their grades, so maybe that has something to do with it. So um, you all have a bio, or at least a partial bio, on your chair. And, and I'm not going to read a bio, but I'm going to tell you the David Cope that I know. Um, so first of all, I want to say that David is a tireless creator and literary citizen. He's published seven books of poetry, chapbooks along the way. He's edited several anthologies, including Song of the Awashtenong, published during his time as a Grand Rapids Poet Laureate, or Poet Laureate of Grand Rapids. He's received a Pushcart Prize, an award from the American Academy Institute of Arts and Letters, all while raising a family with his wife, Sue, and working full time as first a custodian and then an adjunct professor and finally a full time professor at GRCC. All while hanging out with poetic pals such as Allen Ginsberg and Jim Cohn, the, the Beat Era poets, and some fine feminist and activist poets like Diane De Prima and Ad Ann Waldman. Often they appeared together at Naropa University's Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics, <laughs> where terms such as eco-poetry or eco-poetics came into being. And David helped to draft a 1990 ecologically inspired arts manifesto called the Declaration of Interdependence. Oh, and add to this 40 years of publishing a poetry journal, an indie journal that he has published consecutively, which is huge in the indie press world, for 40 plus years, right? Yeah. So I want to start by saying no writer accomplishes this without support. So sorry, Sue, but you got to stand up for some applause. Support from the family is huge to any writer. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I know him well enough to understand that, most likely. So now the David Cope that, that I've come to know is also an incredible friend and mentor. Many, many of his former students know this and they know his generosity and his support in general for arts and arts kind of culture changing effect. Here at GRCC, he was one of four faculty advisors for our display magazine of literature and art. And he helped put together a 100 year anniversary issue that was an amazing compendium of everything from um, the first, you know, uh, I guess you'd call it the first formal named display in 1965 through 2014. 
Um, and I also want to mention, um, Brian mentioned Mike Clawwater, um, the library archivist, and he and several people from the English department, including some student workers, and Rhiannon might be here. Rhiannon, our English department employee, has worked tirelessly on um, a digital archive. So very soon, that digital archive will go out into the world of 100 issues and more of display. So anyway, you can see why I call David tireless. Um, writers aren't supposed to envy each other. We're supposed to be non-competitive. But there's times when I have a little bit of envy of his energy and his productivity. So I'd like to talk about invisible keys just for a minute. Um, it's a retrospective collection with poems spanning 1975 to 2017. So the first time I held the book in my hands and talked to David about it, I said, you know, kind of sillyly, so what's in here? And he said, my whole life. There are poems about workers and the union, protest poems about the environment, its destruction, and the destruction of war. As David said, every war America has been involved in during my lifetime appears in one way or another in his poetry. And I thought I'd mention that on page 20 of this retrospective, um, there's a poem that he wrote, and listen to this title, Once Upon the Contemplation of War. It was 1968 and displays issue seven. So not just once, but many times David has contemplated war. But there are also poems about love, family, and a deep, deep connection to the natural world. Many of his poems hold up the birth of a child, the death of a friend or a parent, the presence of a river or a dune bluff, suspending moments of deep connection so that we, too, can take pause. So what I came to think of when I was um, reading the collection and talking to David about it, because of those both close in and turned out moments, um, I think of David's legacy at this point as a particular form of elegy that you might call an American elegy. Not easy or sentimental, but adept at juxtaposing recognizable moments of love, anger, fear, with a faith that holding these moments takes work, but we'll all be better for it. So, please join me in welcoming poet and literary citizen extraordinaire, David Cope. Marianne forgot one thing. Probably the single most exciting time of my life when I worked here was when we were all on that women's studies group and, and forced the college to change its culture to make room for women's studies, gender studies, and all the rest of it. That was one of the highlights of my life. I mean that. Just suck. I got to get back to you, get down to my lesson. <laughs> well, I can do that. Uh, Eric Grenke is here. Um, he and I have been friends and uh, sometimes had fights uh, from 1970s onwards, something like that. Um, he's a longtime publisher, too. Um, probably much more adept at it than me. I, I'm the sort of catch-as-catch-can, homemade type of thing. He's a real thing. Um, but when I look at it, the title of my, my magazine, Big Scream, was one that Eric gave me. We were sitting around trying to find names for it, and we came up with some really silly ones, the way that Gregory Corso used to do with his books. And uh, he started laughing, and he said, big scream, and I said, God, that's it. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> very glad to have him with us. Um, I'd like to set a tone first. Um, Michigan poet who was teaching at the U of M when I was there, uh, Robert Hayden, was the gift that he basically taught me what not to do, what to do, how to focus. Before that, I'd been sort of a wildcat, I guess is the way I'd put it. And I had great, inspiring teachers here, too, don't get me wrong. But Robert made me bolt down, and we wound up having some of the biggest fights you ever saw in a classroom over poems. 
Um, I'll never forget when he did Crown Me Alice by Ginsburg. Um, but he was also one of the most tender, beautiful people I've ever known. And uh, I, in, by way of setting a tone for this entire reading, this is from his, uh, his most famous, for me, poem, Monet's Water Lilies. Of course, uh, his middle passage poem is one that gets in it, anthologized everywhere, and that's a great, great poem. Monet's Water Lilies, I just want four lines from it. O light beheld as through refracting tears, here is the aura of that world each of us has lost. Here is the shadow of its joy. Thought came to me when I was assembling all this, you know. When Williams introduced Allen Ginsberg in, in one of his books, he said, hold on to your skirts, ladies, we're going through hell. I thought, I was going to start with that, but I don't want to get people too discouraged. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to start with a poem that's not in the book. Uh, you all know what the Kali Yuga is. Hindu concept of the dark age in which the leaders of the world become demons, in which uh, it seems like everything's falling apart and being twisted and torn. Uh, this is the Kali Yuga super blue blood moon to start things. Vicious politicians, screams all across our sorry old globe. Yet tonight is a still night, stars and clouds flung across the ether, my shadow moving on the snow shine, in trees, on the river, as in my childhood and in frozen camp as a young man. Musing beyond destroyed families, bombed communities, specters of Mammon and Moloch marching across the planet. Oh, silence in the inner ear and in that sanctum within where thought dissolves. I have always leapt like a glad day boy, arriving in the promised jeweled light, each instant split into fleeting, shining facets, tender beyond hope beyond dream, even in this elder age where the cloud of thought vanishes at the beckoning grave, the cave where the child still dreams days ahead balancing on shoots breaking the soil to new life, the heart's caught in the hare's leap, the deeper breath. Light the lamp with your shaky hand, old man, and sing. The hopeful day has not yet come the calm, fleeting dawn. Um, I was pretty much shaped by growing up during the Vietnam War. So, and my generation, of course, even to this day, is sort of split in half, those who went and fought and those who protested the war. So this is peace. Starts in a break room at Lincoln School. I was a janitor at the time, and the guys I worked with were all talking about their wartime experiences. Sitting around a table waiting for the day to end, these men relive the war. Sore shoulders and jaws firing rifles at boot camp, the advantages of the M16, how a grenade works, blasting tiny shrapnel in every direction. Roger relives watching perimeters at night, calling artillery strikes on anything that moved. So jumpy, any monkey or snake in the brush might set him off. He talks of loneliness, staring into the alien night when everything he loved was far away. Jerry, fond of guns and tactics, proudly remembers taking an M16 off a dead GI. He'd been issued an M14 and wanted a better gun. This was how to get one. Benny talks of piles of bodies, corpses with arms, heads, legs ripped off, the twisted faces of the dead, the stink that filled his nostrils, a smell he can't forget. He speaks without passion, regretting the wasted effort, the needless deaths. Yet he accepts his part in it, still amazed people could live like this for years, from attack to counterattack, hiding in fields and ditches, finding uncles and sons blasted to pieces more often than children are born. And then the other side, Ann Arbor. 
I was fortunate in Ann Arbor. You got the great education that U of M offers you, but you also got an activist streak that, that uh, comes with the education during those years at any rate. Ann Arbor. After the politician's lies, the funerals of friends, our nightly deaths in the e evening news, our rage swelled into riot. Surging around a lone police car, we smashed the windows out, punching the driver's face in. Others ran through the main streets, store windows, and bank fronts, shattered on the pavement. As the dark night settled in, we blocked traffic, heading farther and farther downtown. Suddenly, police filled the street before us, gas masks, nightsticks, dogs straining at leashes. Charge! Shouts! Screams! Nightsticks cracking skulls. Tear gas all over Main Street. Panic. Some ran blindly in any direction, officers in gas masks at their heels. Others sat down on the street, folding their arms, waiting to be beaten and carried off. Up the dark alley, through side streets, home again. And once home, I looked at my face in the mirror, filled with rage and horror alone and cut off. Years later, on a picnic, we watched light play through willow branches. Listening to this soft breeze, I wonder how I put the violence behind me. So many friends dead, and those come back still dazed and broken. Yet the night passes, somehow. Going to turn a corner here. Um, you all know Hemingway's Two-Hearted River, right? Last of his PTSD stories, find, trying to heal yourself by getting out in the woods. We went and canoed it. I was like ravens over roadkill. Fingers flashing in reeling zebcos the fishermen can't grasp. That some come for the water itself. Tan and red near shore, but so clearly a black mirror where no face appears. Or for lichen rotten, rotted balsam firs lying like corpses across the flow, stacked with flotsam and foam, feathers and bones, the fallen gathered to spin in currents, siphoned and spat down where the portagers put in with a rush as cranes hang almost still in the turning sky above. Yet even the heart cannot fathom what stillness rests in this plunge. Why men sing together like choir boys. Stop the gunnel rush and lay the paddles, lay the paddles down in the whipping breeze where scarred pines bend through storm and sigh and rainbows end. Nor is it clear what draws one to the mouth even as the last ice froze frozen in, frozen in winter's roaring surge break free in great chunks, leaving the churned sand of November's wave again among agates below. Even the dramas of rescue at sea, the poignancy of a captain's last transmission, retold around a kitchen stove in Paradise or Mackinac, by old salts now retired, to muse through waning years with stormy Mondays in the names of the dead cannot pierce through this water to the lost bottom or read the runes on the lights of the, ra of the waves. What's the line from Shakespeare in love? It's a mystery. I'm being silly with you. Going back to janitor years. Brian, you'll know this stuff. Th say thanks to him if you get a chance, because his crew put this together as far as uh, setup. I'm an old janitor myself. I never forgot it. This is AP Wire Story, Janitors at Risk. Gave me a little pause. For years, I breathed spray paint, toluol, methanol, xylene, and hylo fumes uh, under roaring fans in the factory. Then coal dust in aging boiler rooms pulled hot clinkers and breathed the fumes. 
inhaled diatomaceous earth, muriatic acid, and chlorine vapors. Six years at Lincoln Pool. Breathed asbestos in boiler rooms, in tunnels and mechanical rooms across the city. Inhaled chlordane, wood dust, germicide fumes, stone cleaners, boric acid dust, ammonia vapors, almost my whole adult life. Exposed myself daily to shit, piss, vomit, mucus, hair, congealed sweat, menstrual blood, as every janitor does. Today, meetings to save the planet fill auditorium as janitors wheel chemicals for the air conditioning right past the door where the speakers have worked themselves into a righteous frenzy. Oh, sacred soil, I knew you when as a child I sang in your treetops and dove from cliffs to meet the river god face to face. I toss a handful over my shoulder and plant these seeds to keep this dream safe. After Nam War was over, uh, Americans wanted to forget about it. Uh, but Sue came home from church one day, and they were trying to find somebody who would um, sponsor a Vietnamese family. Again, one of the greatest experiences of my life with the Foms. Just lost the father who taught me my first word in Vietnamese, Vietnamese, Hoa Hom, which is rose. I have two of the Vietnam poems from when they first arrived. A Quiet Life. Min will turn down citizenship. He wants to go home. The Texans treated him badly when all he wanted was work, a quiet life. Could we get Song's children out in a month or two? No, said Tom. A time of storms. On my boat, Lynn said, my children go three days, no food, and water only to wet the lips. Four people die, and this in good weather. Hi, Mary. The welfare office. A fat black woman bellows at the face behind the desk, her coat billowing about her boy who clutches her knees Rows of haggard faces wait in a stupor. The bureaucrats take them one by one. Forms and signatures in a cubicle, muffled conversations, mechanical clacking. Drove buses Saigon to Hanoi, two years. Small appliance repair. He's lucky, should be no problem once he learns English. Outside, bodies crowd the light poles. The police lift a derelict from a boarded doorway. For many years, I wasn't making enough on my job as a custodian in order to um, pay the bills, so I worked for slumlords and landlords uh, on weekends in order to make up the difference. Uh, this is a poem called Alone. The boss has gone. Stop. Look out the window. A big man has come out on his porch and stretches in the morning sun, swinging his arms. Up the ladder, I take chisel and hammer in hand and knock out the old plaster. Delicious silence, little sharp raps. And now the neighbor's hanging out his laundry. This is party talk. This is a hard one for me because this is a childhood friend. Over there. Every day it was life and death. My life, so boring since I came back. He leaned forward, pointing his finger at me, knowing I wasn't one of those who faced bullets. Those gooks. You wouldn't believe what they did to the American dead. His fists clenched and unclenched. I thought of the severed Vietnamese fingers my friend's brother had sent back in the mail. There was nothing more to say. I went in the next room and danced with the girls. I don't know why, but war keeps coming up again and again in my work. It always has, as Marianne pointed out. Um, Hemingway once said that um, war is a peculiar gift to a writer because you see the best and the worst in human nature 
in the same situations, if, if that makes sense. My old college roommate, Gary Schmidt, who was valedictorian in my high school class, and I went with Sue and his wife to the Antietam battlefield in Maryland. You all familiar with Antietam? September 12, 1862, 23,000 men killed, wounded, and missing in one day. Just the, the, the scope of that is just unimaginable to me. And of course, even when you go there. Horses' tails swish in a sunlit field. Traveling to Antietam, she recalls a war story. Her father, Uncle Bob said, <laughs> this is going to be hard, was always gentle and kind, always ready to laugh, never angry. Her mother remembered other things. He'd wake up sweating, wild eyes in the night. The German officer he had to shoot point blank. Those eyes, that cringe, night after night. In the cornfield, where the blue boys lurched and shrieked, the cannons are set up as in the old photograph, but freshly painted with an asphalt walkway curving around. In bloody, in bloody Lane, where bodies were heaped up waist high, I marveled at bees in the corn tossels not 30 feet away. Burnside's Bridge, the lazy river barely rippled. 23,000 killed, moon, wounded, and missing here. Such a beautiful vista, the old man said, leaning on his cane. Fields spread out for miles, lines of trees and hills, farmers on tractors, eyes, eyes back and down to the turning disks or pulling tanks, insecticide hissing over the fields, not a cloud in the sky. That poem is always a hard one for me. <clears throat> this is a camping trip with a thunderstorm with my daughter, Anne, uh, my oldest daughter. And uh, there are some things in here, probably two things to touch on. When I'm talking about the woman who had uh, 102 years of dreaming, uh, who, who had just died, that was my grandma. Uh, when they talk about um, the dinosaur bone collector, this was my ancestor, Edward Drinker Cope, the paleontologist. Um, and there's a funny story about him that I put in here. There's a lot of family stuff sort of interwoven in the fact that we could have been killed by a tree falling on us all night long. <laughs> but there's more. Through the tent flap with Anne, half asleep, distant rumbling thunder coming on fast. Last night, I wandered in circles staring up, stars through dark branches, owls calling valley to valley. I dreamed of you waking after 102 years of dreaming enclosed in flesh, gone the dark way now. Visions of puritanical ancestors past, Wiltshire to Delaware machinists, the dinosaur bone collector, efficient and ambitious, whose skull is now some professor's paperweight, and my grandpa, wandering purposefully through his fruit trees. The thunder's closer now, <laughs> Now, torrents of water crash through dark branches. The rain steady, flood heavy. The rivers spring up in pathways to camp. Thunder hammers the earth, which trembles, shakes beneath us. Lightning arcs through the camp, past the tent. Again, we speak in high voices to be heard. What branches above us might shatter, crashing through our skulls to earth? We lean to the open flap to know the splendor of the torrent. In dreams, my father sails out of a starry night, past rocks and wrecks where bones are washed and sink in sand, along Marquette's last route to Illinois, who died bringing words to confused natives who knew well enough the spirits that speak for earth and water. My father ages at the wheel, hands grow gnarled, winds cut great lines in his face. Yet his eyes flash as he closes on the dawn, his Genoa full of wind as he plunges through heavy seas. Later, be calmed, he sings an incantation for the beckoning dead, 
that he might move calmly toward their rest. The morning after is calm, cloudy. Fishermen wade in the swollen river, casting and casting and catching nothing. The silent heron is still. Deer move out across the open plain toward the lake where they lower their heads and lap the still water, ears in alert in this intense silence. Even our hearts beat like hammers now, sending out waves of sound over and over. The breath is a wind that stirs up all the world. This is another uh, apartment cleaning poem, but uh, it's really about one of the tenants. <laughs> Here was my second blues, the second time I wrote a, a poem, a poetry blues. This was a great jazz piano player that I got to know. Of course, by this point, he was an alcoholic. His wife had died, etc. Dead, three parts. Dead, old John premier piano player, found sitting up on his toilet after three days not answering the bell. Yellowing sheet music, old records, unpaid bills piled on his dresser, clock radio blaring the, the latest hits, the morning news, government checks stuffed in the mailbox, unclaimed, no relatives, no claims for his, for his things, landlord to arrange his funeral. Spot on the sax, he's on his knees making that thing scream just above the heads of the dancers who are humping it. Sea of heads jumping in the dark, smoke haze up in the lights, and now it's John's turn. Bass thumping raw nerves, underground raging river. He lights into those high keys, staccato. Fingers flying faster and faster, sweat dripping off his eyebrows, crashing cymbal and snares and high hat clanging. And now the guitar coming in, sweet and low, trying to take it. Even the bouncers at the door look in. The dancers stop dead to watch or collapse into their seats, exhausted. Take it, babe. That guitar out front, all alone, burning away sadness and anger, unpaid bills, careless loves, burning a bright new fire to get them all to that coming dawn, burning all desire away leaving them quiet, breathing softly together at last. Third part. Somewhere, that old tune's floating up in a dingy hallway, one bare bulb hanging, and those keys are rolling waves under fast fingers. And two floors up, a woman sobs alone on rumpled sheets, Shattered glass on the floor, picture on her pillow. Two lovers in white with a red rose. And hearing those notes, again, she'll rise and look out at the empty street, street lights going off in the lavender dawn, and she'll remember and embrace a tender moment in a room like this and wipe her eyes and fix her hair. Who knows who might turn up today, toes still tapping to that old song. I was really lucky to know that man. I had never uh, heard of Sonny Stitt, who was one of the lesser players. When they finally were giving away some of John's possessions, I got a Sonny Stitt collection. <laughs> it's pretty neat. You know, so I'd play Sonny Stitt and all of there, John would be there with me. Uh, there are four or five poems here that are all together, which are, are their highs and lows uh, practically at the same time. Uh, begins with the birth of my daughter, Jane, in 1987. Jane Marie, don't mess with me. Um, she always was that way too. Under my hand, moist forehead, Sue looks up. The doctor's cut through flesh wall, fat layer, still deeper. 
their gloves redden with her blood. She is purely calm, her calm becoming mine. And now the doctor's hand enters her abdomen. The aide pushes, pushes. A blue head appears, wrinkled, angrily drawing breath. A howl as the whole blue body appears, cut and clamp and, <laughs> excuse me, cut and clamp and weigh and check and suck out nostrils. Hand her to the father, me, who sits amazed as blue flesh turns slowly pink, Sue's hand reaching to touch. This is followed a couple years later by what the Chinese call the June 4th incident. Most of us know it as Tiananmen Square. You cannot speak of it in China. Although the Chinese scholars that I know, we've had quite, quite the conversations. Four parts of this poem, Tiananmen Square sequence. The Chinese student revolt has sent all the Western analysts scurrying to their Sunday talk shows. Optimistic dreams about Ms. Liberty, whose lamp shines over a polluted harbor, where little men and women race for more and bigger, better lives and new, improved ways of making cold, hard cash, avoiding above all any talk of breath and death. These students have opened eyes. May they sit and hear the silence. Second part is spider writhing in lamplight. Close the book, turn off the lamp. You too may find light in the dark and see the thread you hang on. Three, the avenue of eternal peace. Bullets spray, bodies are carried off. Troops advance from east and west toward the portrait of Mao, where the students man barricades within with rocks and broken bottles. We wait, listening for dispatches, bringing what news can get out. Once we too dreamed we'd sing our way to peace. Brothers, sisters, I send this sen slender prayer to you. Apology. Fourth one. The lips and cheeks now quiver in the white light in the white room. The body is bent forward on a chair against a wall facing its accusers, soldiers with machine guns. The eyes face the floor and now from the lips and tongue abjectly the apology. About the same time in our lives, Will. This one gets me too. It's my son, Will. Today, overcast but promising spring. Springy step on the green earth. Open the door. Your time is now. The passage isn't simple, but for, the, for those who will come, comes. What your father and mother suffered, what you suffered, is past. No promises. Wake. The heart has a proper place. If you'd be clear, be calm. Child, young man, hard laborer, sage, old fool, make it what you will. Will to make it well. Your hands for tender touch, your ear and eye for compassion. We'll see and hear what's needed. Freely bend your will. Then we get to January 17, 1991. This is Fireball in the Clouds. It was written in the break room down in the main building uh, on G1. Um, some of the scenes in it are sort of surreal versions of talking with secretaries on one main. <laughs> First day of the Gulf War. There's some other stuff that's in here too. But sh The soft snow floats through tight-packed buds and flaming stems. Shadows gesture and talk of ecology. 
Bits of brain, strands of veins cling to their words, unseen. Specters glide in corridors, line up at windows and, list and whisper about the weather. Phones ring, secretaries coo and yak. A red mist descends and settles over everything, unseen. Protesters and flag wavers shout in rivers of blood and oil that also engulf taxis, hydrants, passing buses. Hands rames raised to flaming clouds, a drunken man stumbles and reels into the gutter, empty yellow eyes and open mouth facing fireball heaven. Peace, peace, a million cry. Grenades and flags parading from open mouths. Soldiers at briefings describe mass murder in surgical terms. Blue-eyed innocents parade with flags at the Super Bowl as gassed Kurds and blasted Iraqis mingle in the silent screams that rend tender springtime's sleeping buds. Oh, fleeting doves, oh, soft snow, oh, delicate curve of wild berry, oh, sleeping babe, bombed with dreams, what briefings await you and the netherworld? Sometime after this, I'm still in the 90s, so I'm gradually working my way towards now. <laughs> Thank you. Tender petals for calm, 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 calm clock. Let's start this over. <laughs> Tender petals for calm crossing. Uh, my blood brother, Jimmy Cohn, um, was leaving to get away from the United States for a while, and he went to Machu Picchu and then later down to Pablo Neruda's home in, in Isla Negra. And um, I wrote this poem for him. It's actually for all, all of us, for he and I and all the others. But along this silent path, among cliffs, cliffs through terraced green, you'll sing beneath your breath where the poet dreamed of his escape through the clouds, where whole populations fled to rebuild shattered dreams, hands in moist earth. Stonemasons who shape the rock attentively that it interlock and honor earth that gave both seed and harvest in the sweep of seasons. Ghosts today, they wander here picking your pockets to know what dreams you bring to this place. What breath you leave among these rocks, what song you gather in your backpack and basket of silence. Here, a lost mother weeping for her child born to minutes of love before its last breath. The father pouring a lifetime's devotion through his hands, his face red with defeated love, yet shining in all the brilliance of that loss. Here the lovers moving together, their short gasps echoing in a great sigh through which another child comes. Here the lost father who could not face the wreck of his love in his own child's eyes. His sorrow, a hermit lost in the passes of his own valleys, heart bursting with roses he could not bring to his own table. Here warriors cut down like corn on a day as crisp as this, eyes turning skyward one last time, up to the light as their blood gushes out on fertile ground, shining path where arms and legs of the dead clutch and kick at heaven, vanishing dreams of hungry ghosts. So you come, bringing blessings and eyes to flush the tears that still pool in the world's grief through all the, through all the rages of lost centuries, all the weeping sisters crying for lovers who never appeared, all the lost brothers marched through barbed wire to death's final anonymity, excuse me, in the last burst they'd ever hear, minds turned inward to their mother's cries on the day they forced their way into this light. Compassion now for them all. Let your dream be clear when you come to this pass. I send you this wish where tender petals turn open in both darkness and light. It was my first book or second. I had a poem about when Sue and I fell in love, ending with the idea of let's be famous lovers. <laughs> Silly. 
the rhododendron. <laughs> Sunlight through an open door, crimson blooms swelling to burst. Who can say what love is? You take a friend in hand and roar down blind road after blind road, wandering through private rooms in each other's hearts, sailing through whole histories of pain and rage to find a quiet morning. Do on the laurel leaves. Love is not in the eyes, in the heart, in the entryways and hot spots of flesh, in heavy breathing. Love cannot be contained in soft areas whispered at dawn. It is neither two together nor apart. The eye is in the hand, the heart in the eye, the song exhaled and inhaled, and suddenly your dreams fill rooms where others pace and sing softly of what you were. Oh, love, steady rain on the city of the dead, teardrop on a granite peak, clear day, angel ghosts circling the flowering black oak in every long gone summer night full of thunder, sunlight through an open door, crimson blooms swelling to burst. Funny, I was thinking about this, Eric, when you said there's so much rain in my book. <laughs> <laughs> this in silence uh, it's for my cousin Ann Barber, Barber who uh, worked at St. Vincent's Hospital on 911 and they were on a 24-7 shift waiting for the people who were supposed to come um, just got translated into Chinese for Chinese readers I thought what they want to know about 911 we're at 40 Holy shit, I better finish this quick then. <laughs> hey, David, let me interrupt. I forgot to mention it in my, you know, not so complete intro. Um, when David's done reading, um, we'd like to encourage a little bit of talk back or questions or comments, um, especially since we're in an educational institution. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. All right, 40. So I got five minutes. I better pick my poems fast. <laughs> All right, so... There's a few that I really want to do. I'm not going to do my mom, I guess. I will do, um, let's do Dream of Jerusalem. That'll be one of my moms, I guess. In silence. Hour after hour, they waited in the ER, expecting the onrush of wounded and maimed. Yet there were only firefighters with smoke inhalation, cuts and bruises, hour after hour, the minutes ticking away, the dust not even settled, filling the winter garden, the palm court, where no wounded walked nor rescuers bore the maimed. Only the silence and the realization at last that none would come through the open door beyond the shrieks and sighs and the endless roar. I'll be reading in Long Island next week and uh, uh, I will be able to read to my cousin Anne that poem for the first time. And I asked her if it would be okay if I pointed her out in the audience, and she said, yeah, that'll be fine. Oh. Heroes. You hear about the firefighters and the cops. You don't hear much about the, the, the people in the emergency room. This is a dream of Jerusalem. It's based on uh, Jaume Plentz's um, uh, installation at Meyer Gardens, which were big gongs that you're supposed to go down the row and whack them and, you know, hear the rever reverberations. And on each gong, there were lines from the Song of Songs, which is my favorite book of the Bible. Um, and I took a line from Song of Songs um, as, and adapted it a little bit as the refrain in this poem. Dream of Jerusalem. There's a little Blake's, of Blake's greatest poem, too. If in time the city has been, will be desolate, scattered bones chirping in the dry day, the woman calls her lover to come away, searches without finding, sings silently that none turn to love until it descends in morning dew and in calling doves. As bone fragments and ashes swirl in shining waves, sink into dark murk and are gone, one turns in dreams to the child's eye, the dark circles of bone, where the mother's vision once stirred, where her cheek met the small hand reaching through space. We are creatures made of words, 
rounded by incantation and the great lyric dream. The fullness of young lovers sharing wine in the moonlight in the garden, swearing they'll not turn to love until it descends in morning dew and in calling doves. Here in mountain air and in silence before dawn, in the spirit born of blind sight, the shofar nearby untouched, in this heart shaped by words, there is a presence that could in a soundless tomb shiver the dark with hammers, sound the call in waves, shimmering in all the wheels turning across the universe and make seraphs weep. Yet there is a stillness of the word, the child's mind that turns to her mother and touches her skin made of words, words that measure breath to be shared as tender touch in passing time. Brothers cry out at the prison door. Women sigh in their last dank beds. Boys turn men, shoulder rifles behind dusty tanks. Blood is the cry through a thousand cities. Here, there is silence. Here, light and form, where words bring the lovers together. Here, a dream of soft bodies moving together. The dream at once the child's cry and the mother's last gasp exhaled in fierce sunset as if none may turn to love until it descends in morning dew and in calling doves. Here the desolate city, the deserted temple, the lost tribe. Here the dream wrapped in words that round the breath in silent air. Here ashes that once were man, the bright dream in endless night. Here sun disks eternal round, silence, unheard music of spheres. Let the woman call through the city and on the mountain for her lover. And if she searches without finding, she may hear scattered bones chirping in the dry day and sing silently that none may turn to love until it descends in morning dew and in calling doves. Okay, so I guess I'm going to end on an ass kicker. Hope nobody minds. It's another blues. This for my dear friend Frank Salamone. We were bad boys together when we were here at JC, CC. He got in trouble, I got in trouble. I was at, we were editors at Display, and I, I uh, published a poem that had the word God damn in it, and uh, uh, he had a story with, with the word fuck. <laughs> and there were some Puritans on the uh, staff that wanted us thrown out of school, <laughs> and also wanted Walt Lockwood and um, and Sweats and the rest of them to be censored for publishing such trash. Doc Sweats surprised me. This was my first, our first uh, experience of seeing a defense of freedom of ex expression. He went to the, st to the faculty senate and he raised holy hell about that stuff. Frank and I went through a lot together. I'm not gonna go into it much, but this tells the story in three parts. It's for Frank Salamone who died in 2012. Young Man Blues. Leaning over the guitar, eyes intent on skeletal fingers. Strings leaping with young man fire and long nights burning those notes in the blue room of dreams. To get past the half moon over the broken city, the lost loves to sing through to boom, boom, dawn, running from home, and somehow find the tune that salves the soul and sings free of the many chains that break us all. Taking the dark dream within, living with it, not denying it. When the sky is crying and there's only a pig foot and a bottle of beer and a shaken money maker to find some way to work it through it, transcend it, burnish our hearts with the suffering that none can escape. Two, the gift taken. When the MS took his fingers and silenced his guitar, he sang among the blue gummed skeletons of Providence, he sang he would not be still. Lost to his great gift, he was still able to pluck out camp town races on a banjo that a young girl might find a song. And in later years, even as his body curled against him and left him a bed, his angel friend kept him that he might sing and sigh with a friend. And this is joining the chorus, part three. Here's to Dollar Jarvis workers coming home from long shifts, to Sicilian beauty and elegant silent presence in every gesture. 
Here's to Woody Guthrie, to Bobby Dillon, to Spider John Corner and Robert Johnson, to Mississippi John Hurt and Doc Watson, to Sun House, Hank Williams, to Burnt Yanch and John Renburn, to the 10,000 anonymous pickers and singers still in the blue dream, to Grandma Josie, whose recipes Sue learned by watching. No measurements. To his many loves and fierce friends, years of wanting, running wild with the harp and a bottle of Southern Comfort, yakking till 3 a.m., passing out and yakking again, with no particular place to go and no end in mind. His old National Steel and Martin Guitars weathered classics, silent, now still forever. Now he's free in the rent party rag, wang dang doodle where all careless loves now rest. No police dog blues, hellhounds sighing beneath the table with ham bones and wild women singing like Bessie. Let the freight train rolling thunder midnight special wail down those tracks, trumpets blasting out every window. Free now in the blue chorus of great wailing angels, free, pick and free, when the last deal's gone down, and where indeed we shall not be moved. Not be moved. Not be moved. Hang it on the wall, brother. Thank you. That, those who know the blues know that I adapted a whole lot of lines from a whole lot of songs. It's an important thing to me, the blues. Um, and of course, with Frank. OK. So Dave Oh, I got it. Yeah, OK, um, sorry. This is the hard part. Go ahead. Hi. It's just wonderful to hear your poetry. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for being a musician that struck the chords of history for me. I mean, not just the big stuff like the wars and the protests and love, yeah. but things as minor as the taste of the juice of stolen raspberries. <laughs> there isn't anything like it. Yeah, that's true, especially late at night when you're naked running through the garden. <laughs> 14, 14 years old. <laughs> we did some terrible things, but that's another story. <laughs> Go ahead. You uh, write about your days in Ann Arbor, the Vietnam War protests, uh, mm -hmm. that period in your life. Uh, how, has your perspective on that time changed over the years or looking uh, back? Well, for me, the whole idea is our generation is sort of chopped in half. And the big thing is to find a way to heal when you can. Um, so many of my in-laws uh, and, and friends w fought in the war. And when they talk, I'm not going to pretend to know anything. I never, went, I never judged them. It was always those damn people in Washington. And I still feel that way. When I think of things involving suffering, I try to find the victims and reach out to them. That's what Sue and I did with the Vietnamese family. Because that was a place where we could create healing out of the wounds that that war brought. They would never go back, I mean, other than to visit. Um, uh, their kids grew up and made lives here, and it's been a wonder to watch. So for me, when I look at Nam or, or all those years when I was teaching, and you get those kids coming in that had been warriors in the Gulf War, and afterwards, all those refugees that, that came <coughs> from uh, Ethiopia and Kenya and other places, um, I, I wanted to hear their stories, and Mary, you know as well as I, when, you, when you're doing 102, you got to do some kind of formal academic essay. And one of the things, I don't know if we still do, because this curriculum's gone to hell in the last while, but I don't <laughs> get into that. But it was a formal academic essay then. But uh, when I got a student who had had an overwhelming life experience, I would tell them, you don't worry about being formal here. I want you to write your story and share it. And inevitably, they always did. I'll give you one little example. I had a um, Bosnian girl. She came in, and uh, when I found out about her story, you know, and that was the horrors of that, that conflict, and uh, she wrote two stories that were sort of thinly disguised autobiography. Uh, one of them was about a girl that um, had been a dear friend and who had not been seen for weeks. And uh, the UN peacekeepers went to the house and had to break in, and she had been raped and, uh, and murdered. 
or basically killed herself, one of the two. And in, in any case, it was a horrifying story, and she wanted to just submit it to display. And I said, you realize that 1,500 strangers or more are going to read your story. Are you sure you want to be exposed that way? And she just turned to me and said, Americans need to know these things. They don't suffer the way others do. Bang, opened me right up. And uh, I always thought of that courage that involves, and of course, Carmen Bougon, the greatest student I ever had, I'll be re reading for her next week too, because she set up the reading for me in Long Island. Uh, she was a Romanian F refugee, and uh, the hells that that family went through and somehow came out shining. They did a BBC special on the family where they went back to forgive their neighbors. Yeah. Thank you. Any others? Yeah. David, I wonder, I mean, a, a lot of your, this is a very retrospective reading, and a lot of your poetry is topical and much is personal. Mm -hmm. um, how does the world, how does the world today that we live in inspire the poetry you're writing today or impact the poetry? I'm not writing as much now. I did my big poem, The Train, where I taught Howell and my daughter Jane's class in Chicago last year, and it, it, it was a, that was a really uh, astounding experience for me, taking the train down there and, and writing that poem and coming back. Um, Kali Yuga's Super Blue Blood Moon is the only thing I've written this year. Uh, I, I don't write as much because I've spent the last two years not going to readings, not doing readings. I've been doing editing in a number of different ways. It's been a really, four, to, four hours a day, six hours a day, she sometimes has to tell me, get the hell out of the house. And <laughs> you know, because you work so hard, after a while you get a little tetchy. Um, <laughs> or to Myers. We both found that Myers is wonderful therapy, even if you don't buy anything. But um, to answer that, the main thing was I didn't want to simply repeat some formula. When I, my first two books, I had a lot of objectivist, imagist type poetry, um, short poems that were tight that told a story. Uh, based on the styles of people like William Carlos Williams and his great peer, Charles Reznikoff, and also with a little touch of what Robert Hayden taught me. And uh, Allen Lo Ginsberg loved those poems. He'd take them, he was te teaching them in China when he went there in 1984, and I said, Jesus, Allen, I've moved on from that stuff. <laughs> but I got to, in the second book, I started paying closer attention to the meter in the, in the, um, uh, and the lines, because free verse, you, you can write very tight stuff without worrying about meter, but I wanted to make that line sing, and I wanted to make it snap sometimes, too. And uh, so there were times where I'd get, I'd get something, and it just didn't quite work, and so I started, you know, going through the meter of it, and it was like, oh, here's where I screwed up, and I'd, f you know, figure out the way to, to fix it with le mot juste, as, as, uh, as Pound used to say, the, the, the proper word, the just word, not just a word that'll fill that gap. Um, but it expanded out, and I think some of you heard the crazy gazelles that I've done, or guzzles, as some people like to pronounce it, which I think is a horrible way of calling it. But <laughs> God, guzzle. I'm going to show you my guzzle. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> I, might, I don't mean to insult anybody, but. At any rate, there's that, and there's the two liners, and uh, all my years of studying Dante, I still bow down at his feet and continue learning from his work. So there's a, there's a, the, the, a couplet, the long, long line couplets that are sort of adaptations of both Whitman and Chaucer without the, the insistent rhyme. I mean, I like using rhyme, but I, I like it to be incidental so that it hits you with a punch rather than being predictable. If you've got a predictable rhyme, rhyme you've got something that's a piece of crap. It's one of the things I hate about country music. I know what's coming, <laughs> you know. Oh! Nothing against Willie Nelson, right? <laughs> yeah. Another question. Uh, you touch on different subjects, uh, family, friends, mm -hmm. uh, new, new life experiences. Uh, does your muse uh, have a, a favorite subject that just cries out to? No, uh, the one thing I learned early on was you don't want to be thinking about that. 
because if you start thinking that you become very predictable and you're, you're trying to get that inspiration and it just never comes, what you gotta do is it's like walking around through the city and you, go, you turn a corner and there's an elephant standing on top of a car. There's your poem. And you know, Williams had the idea of the poem is close to your nose. You just look down the end of your nose when you're out on the street and there it is if you look. But you have to be attentive. You have to have all of your senses firing away at the same time. For me, the one thing that I have always wanted to do was catch what I think is the spirit of the time. So if I write about growing up or if I write about uh, the, uh, 1990 or 91 or something like that, it has to deal with the wars because they shaped our country and they continue to shape our country. It's the kind of thing where, you know, like karma, you, you kill somebody and then it's gonna come back to you sooner or later. And when you've got all these people that are wounded, We've got a wounded society. I mean, think about all the wars that have gone on since I was a kid. Jesus, it's a wonder we were all sane. But anyways, <laughs> I hope that makes sense to you. You just have to let it come when it will. Um, the last elegy that I wrote for my mom was, um, we were up at Sharon Winecoop's cottage on, on uh, Crystal Lake, and um, the others were sleeping in, and I, I wanted to go down to the little Jewish deli down there in Beulah because they got the best damn bagels. So I thought, okay, I'll walk down there about a half mile or three quarter mile or something from the cottage down to the deli, and I picked up the bagels and that. And it was odd because my mother came back into my head at that time. She'd been dead for a while at that point. And it was sort of like uh, my, making my final peace with her. And it was hard because she and I did not get along. You know, it was one of those things where uh, she had one idea of what her son was, and I was something totally different. <laughs> but, uh, and it's odd because when I, you know, my dad was very close to me, and um, his poems came fast when he died. The two of them died within the same season, within a month or two of each other. Some of you may remember that. I would not take off from, take the week off from teaching that uh, I was entitled to because I felt that it, I could do more service by staying with my students. If I stayed at home, I'd just wander around and be nervous as a cat. Whereas if I go and model what it is to be honest about your grief and, um, and uh, share it with others, it gives everyone a way to talk about things that sometimes don't make it into the classroom, if that makes sense. And I always wanted to do that when I was teaching because the last thing I wanted to do was be a bean counter <laughs> as a teacher, if it makes sense. Um, but that poem was one of those where it just came to me. It was this beautiful morning on Crystal Lake, and if you've never been to that, to that lake, you do not know what heaven is. The town there is Beulah. That's the third, the third stage towards being inspired in Blake's cosmos. Hope I answered you. <laughs> I think we should probably move toward the book signing portion. Well, if you're the boss. Um, at the table back here, David's I'm supposed to sit over here somewhere? Yeah. Okay. We'll be available.